Are you playing where no one else is? Are you playing to your strengths? Is it hard but not debilitating? And are you gaining momentum? If the answer to those questions are no, then quit because it's time to cut your losses, get the return on that failure and move on to your next S curve. <sighs> I didn't read my first book till I was a junior in high school because I didn't believe I could read. <gasps> For real? For real. You did not, What? how did you get by? Hey there, and welcome to the Unleash Your Greatness Within podcast. I'm TJ Hoisington, and in today's success interview, I was privileged to interview Whitney Johnson. You already know. A passion and my mission to help you unleash your greatness within. My heart goes out to the underdogs, that, that's on our way. If you think you can, go from good to great. Okay, let's motivate. You see, Whitney has written this book, Disrupt Yourself, and let me tell you something. She's been named one of the world's most influential management thinkers by Thinkers 50. She is the CEO and founder of WLJ Advisors, which is a consulting organization that helps coach and consult and so it was really great to have her on the show. And let me tell you, she lays out some strategies and ideas that can help move you as an individual to find more meaning at work, but also help your teams and your organizations get more results. And let me tell you something, what a great, great interview this was. Now, if you're watching this on my YouTube channel, I invite you to subscribe to my YouTube channel and make sure that you click that notification bell so that you're the first to get videos like this in the future, motivational videos and also success interviews by influential thinkers, business owners, athletes, and so forth. Listen, we've got a good lineup of other authors and speakers and so forth, but let me say, this was a real special one for me as we dove into some personal things. And you know what? She really lays out her S-curve framework and I don't wanna to give too much away here, so let's do this. Let's jump right into the interview. Whitney, welcome to the Unleash Your Greatness Within podcast. Thank you, TJ, I'm delighted to be here. I am excited to have you on the show. I found in reading some of your background information, which I want you to share here quickly, is you were named one of the world's 50 most influential management thinkers by Thinkers 50, and you're the CEO and founder of WLJ Advisors. And listen, I know there's a lot for you to share. So <laughs> thanks for being on the show. And why don't you start off, one of the things we like to do with all of our guests is Share with us a little bit of your backstory. Absolutely. Okay. So I, um, I grew up in San Jose, California, pre-Silicon Valley, and pretty typical middle-class background. Uh, studied music in high school. Then I went to college and studied music in college. And then after college, I graduate. I moved to New York with my husband and my husband was getting his PhD at Columbia University. I can actually still feel the terror that I felt as we drove across the George Washington Bridge into Manhattan. And for the first mm. week, I would not go anywhere by myself, but we needed to eat. And so I had to leave our 19th floor apartment and go out and get a job. So why, wait, let me pause you right there. Why <laughs> wouldn't you go out for a week? Cause I was terrified. I was so afraid. And the funny thing is, is that I had, I don't know why, but it's just, it was such a big city and the buildings were so tall mm. and it was just intimidating. And I had never lived in a large city. I had grown up in a suburb and I had lived in uh, Latin America for a couple of years, but it just, it just was intimidating for me and gotcha. scary and terrifying. And I didn't know what I was going to do or, or so, so I didn't want to leave our apartment. I, I did leave it, but I made sure someone would go with me. Gotcha. So okay. I didn't have to do myself. So now though, here we are. And I'm like, okay, I guess I better go get a job because my husband's getting like a $14,000 a year stipend. Mm -hmm. And that is not enough to eat on when you're in New York city, even, you know, 25 years ago. Right. So I go start looking for a job. And, um, there were a couple of problems with that because I was a music major in college. I had zero connections in New York. I had very little confidence as you have now surmised and at the risk of stating what is pretty obvious I'm a female mm -hmm. my first job was as a secretary to a stockbroker so 
I go, there's this, I go to work every day and there's this bullpen, young stockbrokers. It turns out they're all male and um, they're aspiring masters of the universe. Pressure to open accounts is intense. And every day they're saying things like throw down your pom poms and get in the game in order to get people to open accounts. And at first I'm super offended by this because I'm a cheerleader in high school. I failed to include that as well. So I'm a music major, cheerleader, middle class upbringing in San Jose, California, very typical girl kind of thing 30 years ago. And, um, I hear this over and again, and I hear throw down your pom-poms and I'm like, okay, I am going to be working at least five years. Why am I going to make X when 10X is a possibility? And I'm pretty sure that I am just as smart as these guys are. Mm -hmm. And so it was time for me to throw down. I threw down my pom-poms. And so I started taking classes at night, accounting, economics, finance. I had a boss who was willing to let me grow and I was able to move from a secretary to an investment banker. And for those of your audience who know anything about Wall Street, you know, that just doesn't happen. People don't move from being a secretary to investment banker, but I had a boss who made it possible and I did. Mm. And then I had um, two children, which is a very big disruption. <laughs> Moved from equity research, excuse me, from banking to equity research because there was a merger. So I didn't choose that. I got kind of moved, which is like going from flying a fighter jet to a cargo plane. Got Another it. huge disruption. But then several more disruptions later, um, I connected with Clayton Christensen at the Harvard Business School, started a fund with him to invest in disruptive innovation uh, together with his, his son who had just graduated from business school. And now I've become an author and a researcher and I've codified these frameworks of personal disruption. I've written three books and I teach this framework of, of how do you disrupt yourself as a mechanism for building a high growth organization to companies and, and organizations throughout the world. I know, which is amazing. And that's why I'm so excited to have you on the show. <laughs> For the listeners, here is one of her books, Disrupt Yourself, which you've already sort of referred to right now. Let's so you left your your background and then you kind of went to the top of the, the chain here. And it's really exciting to see, you know, I teach the concept of unleash your greatness within. And it, and I always say it's not where you no. start that matters, it's where you finish. And you are a shining example of not being defined by being a female, you already brought that up, and not being defined or using that as a, as a benefit for yourself, not being held back by it, and then becoming one of those influential thinkers. I mean, unbelievable story. So help us understand the concept of and the benefits of disrupting yourself. Yep, absolutely. Okay, so um, I suspect that many of your listeners have heard this term disruptive innovation. And at its simplest, it is a silly little thing that takes over the world. So we saw the um, telephone disrupt the telegraph. We saw the automobile disrupt the horse and buggy. At the time, it seemed a toy, nothing to worry about, no big deal, just a silly little thing. More recently, we've seen Netflix disrupt Blockbuster, Uber is disrupting cabs. So that's what it looks like for a product or service. And this is what's outlined in Clayton's book, um, The Innovator's Dilemma. And the theory behind all this, so it's not just this idea, it's a theory and it was based on his doctoral research is that when you pursue a disruptive course, your odds of success are six times higher and your revenue opportunity is 20 times greater. So that's the theory behind the products and services. The big insight, aha, really that I had is that this theory of disruption, it's not just about products. It's also about people that you start at the bottom of a ladder, you climb to the top, and then you jump to the bottom of a new ladder, like the children's game shoots and ladders. And so after having that aha, and it, it came because I had read the book, I can still remember exactly what part of the book it was in. I had gone to my boss and said, you know, it's time for me to do something new. I've been an institutional investor ranked equity analyst for eight years. I didn't say it quite like that, but that's what was going on in my mind. Right. And he's like, no, we, we like you right where you are. <laughs> of course. And I've now read the innovator's dilemma and to, you know, to use your, your language, I'm like, I want to unleash the greatness within and within a year. Year, I, I quit and um, became an entrepreneur. So, so that's, that's the idea is that you 
you're willing to become a silly little thing so you can take over the world. And just quickly on the math, because I can tell you've got a lot of kind of math people. If you think about this kind of on a graph paper perspective, if, if your Y axis is where you are currently and say you're in your life at a, a 17, well, and, and your, your trajectory is over one, up one. Well, when you disrupt yourself, you are making this conscious decision to go from 17 to 14 on that Y axis of success, however you're defining it, because you believe that in the future, it won't be over one, up one, it's going to be over one, up three, over one, up three. And so you step back in order to grow, you step back to slingshot forward. And that's really what personal disruption is. That's powerful. And I would surmise to say that in order for a person to unleash their greatness within, they have to disrupt themselves. You do. Because so, if you keep doing, you know this, if you keep doing what you've always done, you'll keep getting what you've always got. Mm -hmm. The that's challenge right. is, and maybe we'll get to it later. I want you to go into the S curve a little bit because I think that's really important. But later in the book, you talk about um, it involves fear and involves mm. failure. And how do you respond to that as an individual? So let's save that and let's go to that a little bit okay. later. We'll but, come back. We'll, so, we'll, we'll, we'll save failure for later. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Cause <laughs> well, and the fear that goes, cause it, we're talking about people leaving their comfort zone. Are we not? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we can talk about it. Well, let's okay, talk let's about go, the S curve go. and then I can explain. And then, and cause then it'll make more sense. If we do that. Okay. Got it. Okay. So so what, at the Disruptive Innovation Fund, one of the things that we used um, to figure out how quickly an innovation would be adopted was the S-curve. Yes. So it looks kind of like this, and it was popularized by E.M. Rogers in 1962. And we used it, and he used it to, to again, gauge like how quickly will this innovation, whatever it is, diffuse throughout the marketplace. Well, the second big insight, aha, really, that I had as we were investing is that this S-curve could help us understand how people learn, how we grow. Mm -hmm. So here's what it looks like. So at the base of that S, growth is really slow. Yeah. Um, it feels like a slog and because, and it's not really slow, it just feels slow because you're moving, but you haven't, you haven't hit the knee of the curve yet. And so you're moving along. It feels, it feels discouraging. You can feel overwhelmed. You, you feel like you're not making any progress, mm -hmm. but then what happens is you hit the knee of that curve and then you move into the steep part of the curve. And this is where, you know, enough, but not too much. It's hard, but not too hard. And all of your neurons are firing. Yeah. And whereas at the low end of the S curve, the math says lots of time for very little to happen. Now in the sweet spot in a little time, a lot happens. Totally. That's what it looks and feels like. And that is you know, the best part of the S curve of learning. And then you get to the top. And what happens at the top? Well, you're mastering, you know, you've mastered what it is you're trying to do, but growth has started to slow. And so whereas at the low end, you were overwhelmed. Now you're underwhelmed because you're no longer learning. You're no longer getting dopamine that makes you happy because you're learning. And so what happens when you get to the top of that S curve, you've got to jump to the bottom of a new S curve. That's mm. what growth looks like is you learn, you leap and repeat. So the S curve of learning helps us understand that process of growth that all of us go through. Okay. That's really interesting. You say when you, when you are learning, you are feeling the effects of dopamine and a neurotransmitter in your brain that makes you feel good. Um, I love great? the idea that you jump from S curve to S curve in order to grow. You know, when you talk about the S curve, you just triggered this thought in me is the story of the bamboo tree, right? Oh, for the first more. four years, are you, I don't, maybe you're not, I don't know if you're no, familiar. No, I don't, you don't know. It, so say more. Share okay. it with, everybody okay. wants to hear. Go, TJ, go. They want to know. All right. So the bamboo tree in Japan or wherever, the bamboo tree for the first four years, you plant the seed, you see no growth. The first year, you don't see any growth. The second year, you don't see any growth. The third year, you see a little bit come up above the ground. Yeah. And then yeah. the fourth year, you see it go about six inches. Uh huh. Three months into the fifth year. That bamboo tree grows from, let's say, six inches to 60 or 80 feet, all within three months. Okay, so it's 
growing, 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 but you don't see any of the results, yep. right? Yeah. And then all of a sudden it shoots up. What is happening technically is that somehow inherently it knows that the day is going to come. There are going to be monsoons and heavy winds and strong winds and so forth. It's got to build those roots and then eventually it can then cruise upward and grow. I think that's when I look at your S curve, yeah, I think of, you know, all this time that goes into learning, you're a little bit discouraged, you're not seeing growth because one of the things that we, we train on is the fact that people need to feel a sense of progression or progress. And when mm. people, but what you're saying, if I understand you correctly, what you're saying is you've got to be willing to trust the process when you're not aggressively apparently feeling growing. the growth. Apparently growing. Yeah, exactly. Apparently, yeah, that's a good way to put it. Apparently yeah, you're growing. You're not apparently growing. And, and, and then what's good about it too is that, I mean, we've all had experiences, whether, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're in an organization where you've taken on a new job, you started a new product, you start a new role, and you come home and you're like, I shouldn't have done this. Like this was a mistake. Yeah. Totally. And maybe it was a mistake, but lots of times it just means that you're at the low end of the S curve or you're <laughs> the bamboos in year two. And it's not that nothing is happening. It's just that you're at the low end of the S curve. And so one of the things I love about this framework is that it helps us understand the emotional arc, the emotional journey that we go through when we're trying to learn so that it may again mean that it's the wrong S curve, but it may mean that you just need to persist. And that, that. to me is incredibly comforting when you, you've made that choice to do something new or you've been forced to, but either way, it's a very, um, there's this sort of miasma of messiness when you're at the low end and you need something that will say to you, okay, no, it's okay. That's, this is how it's supposed to feel. Just, just hang in there. Keep going. I love that. I've done a couple podcasts on trust the process, have faith that mm. things are working. What I yeah. love about your work specifically is it gives something tangible behind that. That yeah. Just because you're not seeing the results doesn't mean things aren't happening. I mean, you still got to make sure you're on the right path. You got to make sure you got the right strategy in place. You've got, there are things that you've got to make sure right. are in place, but just because you don't. Okay. I got to throw another thought. You got my, you got me thinking. So yeah, please, you have, go you ahead. have the law of the harvest, right? You have, you reap, number one, you reap what you sow. Number mm -hmm. two, you reap more than you sow. But then number three, which I think ties in here, is what's called delayed gratification. And yes. so sometimes it does take time. So you got to stay in the game long enough to see the fruits of your labors. I love that yep. you, you're nailing this down where it's very tangible to see. I love that. Yeah, good. Thank you. Yeah. So I wrote down in terms of mastery, I'm looking, I'm looking in your book right now. Anyway. Great book, oh, yeah. by the way. I encourage everyone to get your own copy of it. It's powerful. George Burns once said this, I'd rather fail at something that I love than succeed at something that I hate. Yeah. And I wonder yeah. when people get to that mastery level, if they've lost that juice, that excitement, mm -hmm. that, that zest for achieving individual greatness. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think what I would say about that, I, I, again, so we talked about the psychology at the low end of the S curve where you feel overwhelmed yes. and discouraged. Well, the same thing that can happen at the high end is that you feel underwhelmed. And I think that's also really help, helpful from a psychological perspective and, and building on this George Burns quote, which is you might love the company that you're working with. You might yep. love your boss and you might still be really cranky. And I remember, in fact, I was talking to a, a CEO coach and she was telling me that she introduced this framework to one of her CEO clients. And he said, that's why I'm cranky. That's it. why I'm cranky. It's not that I don't love my industry or I even love this company, but I'm at the top of my S curve and I am bored. So I have to figure out what I'm going to do in order to stop being bored. And, and sometimes you can jump to the bottom of a new S curve. If you're the CEO or the owner of a business, you can't. So you have to figure out ways to push yourself back down into the sweet spot of that S curve. But again, it explains that emotional experience that you're having, um, whether you're un or excuse me, overwhelmed, exhilarated, or underwhelmed. Um, it, it's very helpful, again, especially for a, a CEO leader, someone who's at the top of the curve, They're like, oh, no, it's not that I don't hate this business. It's just, I'm bored. I got to find, I so, got to find a way to shake it up. No, that totally makes sense. So let's think about um, a, a company, an organization. Yep. Mm -hmm. For the leaders listening, 
or aspiring leaders, how important is it that leaders look for signs of this mastery and then encourage their people to try new things inside the company? To because because well, I'm imagining taking on a different role or a different project could put you back into that sweet spot. Would you absolutely, say? yeah, okay. absolutely. So, for example, so one of the things that I recommend, um, I, I would recommend that you do, and you can potentially do anybody who's listening is to say, to draw that S and say, okay, where am I on this S curve right now? Am I at the low end? Am I in the sweet spot? Yeah. And, and, and am I at the high end? And then also look at, okay, so where are the people on my team? Where are the people who I'm working most closely with? And depending on where you are on that S curve, you're going to do very different things in order to help people build momentum or regain momentum if it, as it were. So if they're, if they're at the low end of that S curve, I know that they need support because they're feeling overwhelmed and support can come in lots of different ways, whether it's encouragement, facilitating their training and learning and, and the money shot of support is valuing their inexperience, valuing the fact that they're going to ask you questions like, why are we doing it like this? And you're like, annoyed, get to work, ego totally threatened because they're asking why you do it like this. But those questions are not only what opens the door to innovation and why you need 15% of your people on the low end, but they also say to them, I value you. I value the one thing that you can do that nobody else in this company can do is that you're not blind by familiarity so you can ask those questions that will allow us to innovate. Then in the sweet spot, what you need to know is you need to say, okay, this person's really good and I'm like inclined to just leave them alone, but you now know they actually need you to focus on them. They need you to continue to stretch them so that they can stay in that sweet spot because we need something to push against in order to, to maintain our momentum and they need you to thank them and appreciate them. And then at the top of the curve, what do they need? Well, they're bored. So you really now want to just leave them be. You've got to challenge them. Well, what does a challenge look like? It can look like a number of different things. One can be they jump to a new curve. As we know, sometimes that's not possible. So you can have them jump in place. Jumping in place looks like getting a coach, right? You might be great as a subject matter expert, but are you great as a leader? Maybe not. A coach can help you with that. You can study your industry. You can also do things like um, become a master to the apprentice. You know, learning how to mentor people and bringing them along a curve is a totally different skill set than being a subject matter expert. And then you can give people stretch assignments that push them back down into the steep part of the curve. And they don't need to be major, major ones. I'll give you one quick example is um, I was over in India last year and speaking at SAP and I met a guy who's a mid-level manager. He's an engineer. He had just inherited a team. They're all at the top of the S curve. They don't want to jump and he can't make them jump. He inherited the team, but he can make them stretch. So what does he do? Super simple thing. They have to give a presentation to management. They had this protocol for how they delivered, you know, quarterly results. And um, instead of letting them do the way they had always done it, he made them practice. And he practiced and they 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 complained. Oh, they complained. Like, this isn't how we do it. Blah, 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 blah. Typical top of the S curve kinds of things. But the presentation went well because he stretched them. And at the end of the year, they're like, this was a highlight for us. So top of the curve weren't jumping to a brand new one, but they got this stretch assignment that pushed them back down into the sweet spot of the S curve. So there are a number of things you can do as a leader. If you're starting to sense that they're dialing it in, they're a little bit bored, this isn't how we do things here. One of the first places to start is to give them something that will really stretch them. That was well said. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. I'm going to take a little snippet of that and make sure I put that out there. I think you just okay. clearly showed what the responsibility of leadership and how they can get more out of their people. The fact that you should leaders should be listening to those, the, the lower, the 15% group, because you're right, they're unfamiliar with the rules and how things are done within the company. And so they might see things out of the box that everybody else is missing. Right. And, I, and so I think that's awesome. And then to know that we've got to encourage and create opportunities to stretch for the, for the middle group, mm -hmm. and then definitely stretch for the mastery group. Yep. Great. Nice. There you nice. go. Okay. Support, focus, challenge. Support, focus, focus, challenge. Challenge, right. And for you, the person who's having the experience, you're overwhelmed, you're exhilarated, 
you're underwhelmed. How did you come up with this? I mean, back and take us back into history a little bit. You know, TJ, that is the best question ever. And I don't have a good answer for it. <laughs> I, I, I think, you know, I, I said to you earlier, like I had that aha when we were investing that sure. like this S curve could help us understand how we grow. But um, I think, I think if, if you're thinking about this and anybody who's listening, you realize that these ideas that you have over time, you just, you're just constantly thinking about them. And then someone says something to you and you're like, oh yeah. And you just, you're just continually iterating with what you think about and conversations you have. And over time, just the ideas evolve. It's, it's, it's evolution at its, but it's evolution it's with ideas. And just for the record, I've been there too. There are some ideas that I've come up with, like the BSA results formula that just, I don't know exactly the moment it came to me, no. but it came to me through a period of time yeah. and it just, boom. Well, some of it, I mean, I think, you know, I think, I think most people listening to this believe in some sort of inspiration and flash of insight. And I know I sure. certainly I do. And I, I think that there is obviously some element of that. So there's those flashes of inspiration, that insight, but then there's also just that sort of in the trenches, bouncing your ideas off of other people. And then over time, they just, they develop. That's great. Okay. I want to talk to some, let's, let's address some of your key points here. Talk about what it means to take, because we have entrepreneurs listening to this and leaders mm -hmm. listening to this and so mm -hmm. forth. What does it mean to take the right risks? What are we huh. looking for when we're taking the right risks? Yeah. So that's the very first accelerant of, of personal disruption. So if we come back to this idea of the S curve, we now know the S curve explains how we grow, what it feels like, okay. um, what it looks like. So then the question becomes is, okay, now that we know how we grow, how do you move up that S curve systematically effectively? Because if you're, if you're looking at becoming a high growth individual, because high growth organizations, which presumably all of you who are listening have or want to have right, right. need high growth individuals. How do you do that? And the way you do it is you disrupt yourself. But in the meantime, how do you move up the S curve? So the first accelerant of personal disruption, and there are seven, is to take the right risks. And what do I mean when I say that? Well, I think of it in, this, in these terms. There are two kinds of risks. There's competitive risk and there's market risk. Okay. So competitive risk is where there's a big opportunity. You've got projections. You can scope out the market. You just have to figure out if you can compete and win. That's competitive risk. Market risk is where you don't know if there's an opportunity, but if there is, there's no competition. Now, as an entrepreneur, you're pretty accustomed to thinking about this with your product, with your company. And we know from the theory of disruption, this is where the odds of success are six times higher because market risk is basically not taking on competitive risk. It's playing where no one else is playing. Right. That's what it looks like for you as a company. But what does it look like for you as an individual? Well, as an individual, competitive risk looks like big job. You can see the job posting either inside your company, LinkedIn, wherever. And you're like, I really want this job, but there's 20 people who are applying for this. Can I compete? Can I win? Maybe, maybe not. Market risk, again, looks like, well, I don't know if there's an opportunity, but there's a problem and I can see it needs to be solved. If I can create the market, if I can create the opportunity, then there won't be 10 applicants. There's just going to be you. And so I want you to think about it's never going to be black and white pure competitive, pure market risk. But the more you can focus on taking on market risk, on playing where no one else is playing, the more successful you will be. And I want to just leave you on this idea with one quote that is super powerful. I got it from Bob Proctor. I don't know if he said it mm -hmm. originally, but I love it. It's amateurs compete and professionals create. Oh, Isn't that good? That's good. Amateurs compete, professionals create. So that's what you're looking for. You're looking for market risk in your business, which is playing where no one else is playing and market risk for you as a person. And by the way, as a leader, it's always market risk because there's always enough space for another great leader. Abundance mindset right there. Yeah, absolutely. And, and just to give you a, a practical example of this, because I for think sure. this might be helpful for for your listeners is that when I worked on Wall Street, um, I was in investment banking. And as I um, kind of alluded to earlier, my boss gets fired and I get moved, basically shoved into equity research. And um, if you know the pecking order of investment banking and equity research, like 
we're on the y-axis, it's a big move down the y-axis. Right. Um, and then once I get there, I'm supposed to cover the cement and construction sector, but we just had a merger and they'd already had a highly ranked cement and construction mm -hmm. analyst. So in this particular context, how was I going to play where no one else is playing? How was I going to take on market risk? Turns out that there were at this point in time, this is like 2000 and oh, no, 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 it was earlier than that, 1996, 1997. Okay. There were a number of um, media companies going public and no analyst to cover them. So as a theory of disruption would dictate, rather than knocking on a cement door that was closed, that was competitive risk, mm -hmm. I built my own media door. I took on market risk. And because I built that media door within one year, rather one year, instead of waiting a long time to become a ranked analyst, I, I, I was at the top of the leaderboard. I was ranked number three in one year. And now here's the thing that I want all of you to remember, because I think, again, this is important. Personal disruption, the fundamental unit of growth in any organization is the individual. When I built a door for me, I built a door for my company. Yes. By finding a place for me to play, I found a place for my company to play. And so that's why I say fundamental unit of growth disruption. It's the individual. It's always the individual. So find a place for you to play. You'll find a place for your company to play. Love that. Love that. Okay. Let's go through some of the other accelerators. Play to your distinctive strengths. I love that. There's been more research on this, I would say in the last 15 years on yeah. the power of strengths and playing towards your strengths. What are some of your key thoughts on that? Yeah. So on that is, so distinctive strengths are things that you do well, that people around you do not like the koala you know, that cuddly little animal, it sleeps yep. 20 hours a day. You're like, how can it even survive? Well, it does because it has a distinctive strength. It eats eucalyptus leaves. They're poisonous. No one else can eat them. Pretty easy for them to survive. So the thing that is interesting about strengths, I'll just highlight two things. Number one is that we don't actually know what they are. We tend to be blind to their, our strengths because uh, there are things that we do reflexively well. And so we think, well, how can that possibly be valuable? Let so me pause one, you there. The easier it is to be good, the more difficult it is to be great because we get comfortable. Oh, I love that. I've we, never heard that before. Yeah, yeah. So when yes, I wrote when I wrote the I book, agree. The Secret of the Slide Edge with yeah. uh, Bob Moad, yeah. we wrote that in the book, which is the easier it is to be good. And it goes to your point right here. We, so true. It's a blind spot. We settle. We don't realize we have this unique aspect to us that could take us to the next level. And we're not even using it. Okay, sorry to interrupt you. Oh, I, that was worthy of interruption. I love that. So yeah, so you're, it's like we're, we don't value it. And to your point, then you don't, you don't develop it. So one of the clues for you is like, listen to the compliments that you get that you dismiss. Mm -hmm. um, next time someone gives you a compliment instead of deflecting it, which most of us do, um, or thinking, oh, oh, that compliment again, like compliment is something that I had to work hard to figure out how to do. Um, write it down because that's your genius. And, and then as a manager, the thing that I would encourage you all to do is you're going to be very clear on what the superpowers are of the people that work for you. One of the things you need to be aware of though, is that when you try to get them to play to their strengths, mm -hmm. if you don't do it, if you don't frame it properly, they're going to actually take it as a ding. Cause they're going to think, well, they want me to go do th that thing that's easy for me. So they must not value me. So what you've got to do is be like, okay, this is your superpower. We need you to use this because it's really valuable to us as the organization. And oh, by the way, I'm going to give you this really hard thing to do, but let's be clear. You won't be able to do it if you don't use your superpower. So that's what you want to know about your distinctive strengths. When you feel strong, then you're willing to play where no one else is playing. And when you play where no one else is playing, then your odds of success are six times higher and you start to move up that S curve faster. Powerful, powerful. Okay. This one I think will be really valuable as well because all, all your accelerators are powerful. And, um, but embrace constraints. Mm, yeah. Ooh, this is the painful part sometimes, right? Is to embrace yeah. that part of you that, okay, go ahead. I'll let you explain. Yeah. Well, I'm sure you have plenty of stories, but so here's, here's the essence of it. Uh, I start to move up that curve. You're like, okay, here we go. Play to my strengths, play where no one else is it now. If I only had enough time, enough money, enough expertise, I could get people to buy into my ideas. Then I could move into the sweet spot, but that's actually a fallacy because mm -hmm. It's a law of physics. In order to gain momentum, we have to have something to bump up against, to push against. We need friction. And so for you to all think through this, like, 
actually, since you're entrepreneurs, I'm going to give you this data point because I think you'll find this interesting. So there's this postmortem, 200 failed startups. They divide them into funded and unfunded startups. Funded, obviously raised outside capital, plenty of you know, cash on the balance sheet, unfunded, they bootstrapped, built, through, built the business through operating cash flow. The number one reason that the funded startups went out of business was they ran out of cash. <laughs> it was only the number 10 reason for the unfunded startups. So what happened? They had too many resources. And when they had too many resources, they didn't have to make decisions. They didn't have to do what Clayton says. They didn't have to be patient for, no, what is it? Let me make sure I get it right. Patient for growth, impatient for profits. Mm -hmm because they had too many resources. So the next time you find yourself being like, if only I had more of X, remember the constraints, if you will reframe it, can become a tool of creation. And in fact, you need, you must have those constraints in order to accelerate up your, up your S curve. Powerful, okay. Which that leads into the next accelerator around entitlement, the innovation yeah. killer. Oh, oh, isn't yeah. this the, the okay. oh, this one's such a hard one. So, so entitlement is basically the belief that my experience, um, who I am is fundamentally more valuable or less valuable than the person to my right or left. Um, it comes in many guises. The, a really simple one, because I've had, I've presented this idea and people say to me, well, I'm not entitled. I've worked hard. I'm an entrepreneur. I've worked really hard for this. Mm -hmm. And then I look at them and I say to them, have you ever shown up late for a meeting? Okay, that's everyone on the planet. We've all shown up late for a meeting. And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, well, then that's entitled. Because when I show up late for a meeting, what am I saying? I'm saying my time is more valuable than your time. For sure. Now, what does this mean? Well, the more successful you are, the more you think you deserve your success. And the more successful you are, again, we're thinking about that S curve, right when you get into that sweet spot and everything is working because you're growing really fast. You have the cognitive, you have the emotional, you have the financial bandwidth to ask things like, well, what could I do differently? How could I be better? You're like, no, this is the way things will and should always be. And so that entitlement starts to push you back down the curve. And so that's why it's the curve killer because you can, you can lope your way up that S curve without some of these other things being in place, but the entitlement, it's going to kill you every time. So mm. you have to watch out for it because we're all going to do it. So that was, I totally agree. And that was um, my oldest son, Bryce, playing football. It was his dream to one day play college football and then eventually make it into the NFL. One challenge was he's only 5'8". Oh, yeah. Right? That's so that, that's a big challenge. But I'll, I'll just yeah. share this as it relates to this point. He comes out of a sophomore year having done pretty well as running back. I don't know, 1,500 okay. yards for the season for any football followers. So he ended that season, and he came to me, and he said, Dad, I want to break the Washington State record as a running back his junior year. That was his goal. So That's he awesome. practiced when nobody else was practicing. He would take yeah. this sled that he borrowed from the school, put 50 pounds on it, and go down to the local elementary school and, and pull that weight and sprint. He did it four times a week after football practice or after wrestling yeah. practice or after yeah. whatever season we were in, he goes into his junior year and lo and behold, he starts averaging roughly 300 yards a game. And if you're a football follower for any of the listeners, that's pretty good. Uh, 300 yards for running back a game yeah. is pretty good. Okay. Yeah. So halfway through the season, he was already leading all the other rushers in the state. Nike called him. Uh, he went up. The Seattle Times called him to do a, a, a kind of a story on him, yeah. so forth. And I kept reminding him that concept mm -hmm. of don't become, <laughs> don't, don't adopt that entitled mindset. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. so he would tell me stories of where he pushed back on that entitlement. Number one, he would, he would exercise outside of practice, right? He would practice mm -hmm. outside of practice. That's where champions mm -hmm. are really made. And yeah. then, and then he's, he would, when, when the coaches or someone would say, Bryce, you're amazing inside the locker room. I would yeah. ask him, well, how did you respond? He said, I just put my head down and quietly said, thank you. And I and, and I, I believe that year, I think a big reason why he broke that record which still holds true today for the most 
running yards for a running back in a season. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of that has to do with he never embraced entitlement. He knew, even though he was already at the top of the food chain, if you will, he knew for him to, to break that record, he couldn't get slothful. He couldn't get prideful. He couldn't get arrogant. He had to mm-hmm. stay focused on the end goal. And I think, I think that it is the innovation oh, killer. That, right? First of all, that is a great story. Go oh. Bryce. Yeah, right. um, and then, and then I think, I, and that's going to serve him the rest of his life. And, and totally. I think if we bring this back to the S curve, because of course I love the S curve, if you think yeah. about it, what would have happened is if he had, you know, gotten into five games and he's now at 1500. So he's like basically beaten his record from the year before. Exactly. He would have been at the top of the curve and could have precipitated his own demise. But basically in his mind, from a mental game perspective, he stayed in the sweet spot where he knew enough, but not too much, but he was constantly challenging himself. And because he did, he just kept getting better, which is so great. That's I- awesome. I love your S curve. It just, it makes it so clear where people need to, move themselves yeah well i'm genuflecting at bryce so i I wish he had i wish he had gone to svu southern virginia university where my husband teaches is they tried they called him several times oh yeah oh yeah oh well but you know concussions you know he yeah it's a bad thing at some point you have to i mean byu actually uh came and 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 looked at him and so forth and there was a running back at the time, Jamal Williams, who plays for the NFL right now. And they said, well, yeah. Bryce, technically your stats um, were close or were even better than Jamal Williams at the time uh, based mm-hmm. on the number of yards run, yeah. balls carried, so forth, nationally speaking. But BYU basically said, and I think it's true, they said the difference is we're going to pick a Jamal Williams any day over you. Even if the stats, even if your stats are slightly better, and I don't know if they were, but I, it was close. I don't know. I don't remember exactly. But they said he's six foot one or six foot two versus oh. five foot eight, right? So anyway, mm-hmm. that's that. But he, that's like you said, he can apply that principle of staying <sighs> oh, in yeah. that sweet spot, not oh, getting yeah. too prideful, right? And everybody could do this. That's why I say the easier it is to be good, the more difficult it is to be great because we start to settle. We start to become entitled. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Don't become entitled. No, that's okay. right. Now, I went through a couple things. Uh, in chapter six, yep. that would be nine, page 95 that I'm on. You said, give failure its due. So I underlined a couple things. Let me get to it. Hmm. All right. In one section on page 106, you talk about know when it's okay to quit. I just, Mm -hmm. you know, we, in the personal development industry, and I've been in this industry since my first book came out in 2005, I've taught people never give up. Winston Churchill, never give up, right? But that's all within context. It's probably a good yeah. thing to quit smoking, for example. Yeah. I'm just saying for yeah. health reasons. Yeah. So exactly. there is an appropriate time to quit. What is your thoughts on when it comes to being risk yeah, I adverse? Have quote, I have this quote in here somewhere. I don't know where it exactly is, um, but it's from Seth Godin. And he says, winners quit all the time. They just quit the right stuff at the right time. And I think I think this goes to this idea of, um, so let's go back to the theory of disruption. We know that the odds of success are six times higher, as I said earlier, but that's 6% to 36%. So there's still a 64% chance it's the wrong curve. And what we know from the research is that if you're on a curve and it is the wrong curve, it actually has deleterious effects. It has a negative effect on your health and on your psyche. Mm. And so one of the things you want to do is you want to get onto a new curve. But when you realize it's not the right curve, you need to be willing to jump to a brand new curve. And um, so that's the Seth Godin. Winners quit all the time. They just quit the right stuff at the right time. Um, And and four quick questions that you can actually ask yourself um, that might be helpful because we're talking a lot about this is, you know, if you're trying to like, well, is this the right curve? Is it the wrong curve? I'm not, I feel like I'm at the low end and I'm frustrated. I'm discouraged. Should I change? I don't know what Mm -hmm. to do. Well, four quick questions. Number one, are you playing where no one else is playing? 
sound familiar? Number two, um, do you, are you playing to your strengths? Like I, I remember we had this idea for a business years ago. It was for something around photography, which was a great idea. But since I don't really ever take pictures, probably not playing to my strengths. So are you playing to your distinctive strengths? Third question is, is it hard, but not debilitating? I think we've all had experiences where we wake up and we're like, this is hard, but oh, I feel so alive. Like I am so happy. I love doing this. And there have also been experiences where it's hard and you, you're actually getting sick. Like I had a job at one point that I was getting sick. Like that is a symptom of a flatlining curve. And then the question number four you want to ask yourself is, are you gaining momentum? Like you're going to be able to see, even though the growth is slow, you're still gaining momentum. So are you playing where no one else is? Are you playing to your strengths? Is it hard but not debilitating? And are you gaining momentum? If the answer to those questions are no, then quit because it's time to cut your losses, get the return on that failure and move on to your next S curve. <sighs> I didn't read my first book till I was a junior in high school because I didn't believe I could read. <gasps> For real? For real. You did not, what, how did you get by? What I did you cheated. do? That I didn't amazing. totally cheat, but I had friends, a really good best friend who, uh, he was just an awesome, he still is an awesome friend today that helped me understand things and helped me write things. And I didn't. How did you manage? Like, how did you navigate when you couldn't read? I know. I'm glad you appreciate that. I didn't. I can't even imagine. My first book I ever read, I remember one day, I don't know why I'm sharing this right now, it's, but it's amazing, especially because you've now written like 10 books. So keep going. Tell us a story. This exactly. Is so I remember I was 15 years old and I, I found this tape on my dad's dresser on one side, the ta cassette tape back. And so this takes you back a few years, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Cassette yeah. tape on one side. It was a copy tape and my dad's handwriting on it. It said how to turn your life around on one side. And on the other side, it said how to live financially independent. And I came from a family with a lot of love in the family, but financially it was, it was a big family. Not independent. It, yeah, right, right. It was not independent. But the guy on the tape, his name was Jim Rohn, the classic <gasps> famed business philosopher, uh, Tony Robbins's first you know, employer in the personal development right. industry. And I remember listening to that tape as a 15-year-old and I remember he would say, if you don't read, you get rickets of the mind. And I would, I would hear him say, all leaders are readers. And I just remember going, laying there thinking, and then he would say, you could have any life you want if you'll change your thinking. And okay, so long story short. <gasps> I'm getting chills. This is amazing. <laughs> so I'm laying there as a 15-year-old, and this thought comes to me, TJ, you need to read a book. So I, 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 I didn't, I pushed back on it because that was a constraint. So I listened to another tape by Zig Ziglar. I found it at a garage sale. Yeah. And Zig Ziglar said, all leaders are readers. I thought, what? And then I listened to a tape by Les Brown, who I've interviewed on my podcast. Les Brown, the famed motivational speaker, who said all leaders are readers, that the average American reads one book a year. And I remember laying there as a 15-year-old listening to these tapes telling me, TJ, you got to read. Finally, I faced my own deficiency in the sense that Hey, face it, TJ, you're going to have to learn to read if you're going to be successful in life. And so I went to the bookstore and I bought my first book, which was called by Hap Klopp, the founder of the North Face Company, The Adventure of Leadership. It took me six months to get through that book. I've since read it 10 times and still quote it today. He's also been a guest on the podcast as well. So I've been very open about that. But that book and then other books I've read, I mean, you today, right? I've read hundreds of books but I'm still not the fastest reader. My point in sharing that is I have written several books. Here, I'll share this with you. I don't know if I've shared this with my audience before. I've written two novels taking on a classic, Swiss Family Robinson. And if you go to Wikipedia, you'll see that I'm the first uh, sequel in 100 years. Um, <laughs> I will say I've never read a novel in my life. And I wrote one. And You've never read a novel. Never. And, it's, and it has scored on Amazon, for example, all straight fives across the board. Five star. My point is this. Number one, when you don't see progress, but you know you're on the right path, don't jump out of the game too early. Number two, understand that you're going to have constraints. My constraint was 
because reading is difficult for me, you'll find that my Audible library is huge, right? And so I can, I still read. I read your book, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and which, by the way, let me put it up here. Disrupt yourself. Make sure you get a copy of this. I think you've just explained concepts in this that are very powerful. But my point is you can do hard things. Don't give up when you know you're on the right path. And it may mean that you've got to do things that are difficult. You're not going to rise to the top by just doing easy things. You've got to be willing to put yourself out there and do hard things. And, Mm -hmm. and in doing that, you got to trust the strategy, but trust your heart too. And then stay in, in the game long enough to see the fruition of your labors. Any, any thoughts, any of that? Well, I just think that's so inspiring that you, I mean, you know, I think about this idea of, of personal disruption and you've really encapsulated it is that when you disrupt yourself, we, we talk about taking the right risks and thinking about that from a career standpoint, et cetera. But when you really think about the hardest and most important disrupting you will ever do is to step back from who you are into who you can be. And just hearing your story, it's very emotional to hear that of like you were a 15 year old and you just said, I want something different. And you learned, you've listened to these tapes and now you have written all these books. And that to me, I love that you have this, you want to unleash the greatness within. And I love that there is this, this, you know, sinking of what you're saying and what you're doing. It's just very, very powerful. And um, so thank you. I know your listeners have heard this, but thank you for sharing it with me. No, you bet. You have a special spirit about you and I can feel you. And uh, I just hope to be, and I know you do too. I, I assume you do too, is just to be a hope of inspiration to people Yeah, that they'll stretch because there's so much greatness within. And I, and I love the concepts that you put forward on page. Um, thank you for sharing that. It's awesome. <laughs> So on page 69, the antidote, be grateful. Let me just read the first line. To rid yourself of selfishness and entitlement, try keeping a gratitude journal, a list of three things you are thankful for each day and why, why you're thankful Mm -hmm. for them, really. I just think gratitude, I've I've said this on another podcast, is a celestial law. There's something special with people that are just grateful. For the good, yeah. the bad, the ugly. Just grateful. I actually have two thoughts. Yes. Uh, probably more than two thoughts on that. But one is uh, something I came across not too long ago. It was by Wallace D. Waddles. And there's a really practical reason for being grateful, which is whatever you focus your energy on, you get more of. So if you think about, you know, you talked about financial independence earlier. Like if you talk about building wealth and you think about it all the time and you're grateful for what you have, then you're going to get more wealth. If you think about debt all the time and you're going to get lots more debt. So whatever you're grateful for, you're going to get more of. So there's a very practical consideration of that. But I also think, and this is a lesson that I learned a few years ago, and I I think I might've shared it in here, but I don't remember for sure is that um, we, you know, we heard that expression and you get what you get and you don't throw a fit. And, but I realized a few years ago that you, the reason we're grateful, there's actually a much more profound reason for that. And sometimes um, when things are hard, you, the only way through is to be grateful. Um, 2012 was a really difficult year for, for me in particular, um, but in some ways it could have been a great year. So in that year, my husband was diagnosed with cancer. He's okay, but he was diagnosed okay. with cancer. Mm-hmm. Um, we had had, had a f- huge... I think we'd had a huge financial setback and my brother committed suicide. So on the one hand, you're like, this is the most terrible year ever. But at the same time, you know, there were wonderful family. Um, I had just published my first book and I realized, okay, I was now going to have to make a choice. Am I going to be bitter or am I going to be grateful? Like, and, and I realized that the only way through here is to be grateful. Like I was just going to have to choose to do that. And so that's why I think from this idea of battling our sense of entitlement is the only way through the only antidote to that is to just to say, okay, I'm going to be grateful. And if I'm grateful, then I will get more of whatever this is. And I'm just going to appreciate what I have. And so that, that that's why it's the antidote. Love it. And what a great antidote it is. I'm glad that you put that out there for anybody struggling with anything. Find a, find something you can be thankful for in this right. moment. Yep. Exactly. Powerful. That is really powerful. 
Whitney. Um, in terms of quitting, you say, you talk about, can I try something new? Why won't I? And then you put down here, I'm, and I'm skipping around. Yeah. I'm on page 108. Okay. I have enough money to quit, but oh, I don't. Okay. Why you number one? That story? <laughs> Why number one? And maybe you can give some background on this, but yeah. Yeah. Five yeah. Lines. So Go here, ahead. here's the background. And this goes back to what you were saying at the very beginning, this idea of fear. So um, I, I had talked about this with this fellow. I, I posted a piece on um, HBR, Harvard Business Review, and this man named Ramesh came, comes to me and he's like, well, you know what? I, I can't do it. Like, I can't disrupt myself. And I was like, well, why? And he go, and, and I said, you know, do you not have enough money? Because oftentimes people are like, well, I don't have, he's like, well, no, I have 10 years worth of savings in the bank. I'm like, 10 years worth of savings in the know, bank that's awesome. and you can't become an entrepreneur. And, and so then I was like, okay, so what else is going on? And mm -hmm. this goes to this technique of Toyota that they use to try to get to the bottom of like systemically what was going wrong. And they found that if you asked why five times, then you would finally get to the root cause. So for example, I don't have, I have enough money to quit, but I don't. Well, why? Well, I don't know what I would do next. Well, mm -hmm. okay. Why? Again, I don't know what I like to do. Well, why? Again, why? Because I'm always working. Why number four? Working is what I know how to do. Why number five? My job is my identity. And yeah. then you're like, oh, okay. So what we now know is that if we jump to the bottom of a new S curve, we're afraid that we will lose our identity. And once we know that, then we, we, we know what that, you know, we know what the question is. And once you know what the actual question is, is how do I deal with the loss of identity that will come for me when I decide to disrupt myself? Now we have a question that we can answer because it's the right question. Love it. But when, would you agree with this? But when the purpose and the meaning and the vision is high, the less the identity will be an issue. It could still be an issue, but I just oh, think- I agree with that. I agree. I agree. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's, yeah, absolutely. So what I would say is that because when you know, okay, I just interviewed Simon Sinek for my podcast. So like I have Simon Sinek on the brain. Um, he, all, he talks about start with why. And so I've been thinking about, well, what's my why? And he talks about this notion of an existential flex. When you know what your why is, then you can do a lot of flexing because you've got this whole big umbrella <laughs> under which that, you know, this canopy under which you can work. And so That's right. to your point, TJ, is once you know what your why is, what your purpose is, there are all sorts of things that you can choose to do, your identity, um, your, you know what your identity is. So everything else just becomes kind of tactical because you, you've already answered the really big existential question. That's it. So identity when I saw is, myself as an author early on yeah, yeah. or writing a novel, yeah. the why was so big. I could see myself walking down the red carpet when the movie comes out at some future date, hopefully, right? That kind of a thing. I, the why yeah. was so big all the little doubts behind it kind of went aside because it just, like you said, just became tactical. Okay. One foot in front yeah. of the other one foot in front. This is exciting. And I just have to pause momentarily to envision my end result, come back and one foot in front of the other one foot, yeah. in front of, pause, come back, stay focused. Uh huh. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Whitney, Fun. Whitney, you, I can just tell we could go on for hours. I think we could, but we have to wrap up, don't we? Yes, we do. Not that I want to, but your book is powerful. Disrupt yourself. I want everybody to, to make sure that you read the book. I get the book and read the book. It is important that we disrupt ourselves, especially in this competitive marketplace that we live in today. If it's, if your goal is money related, is career related, you've got to disrupt yourself. You're going to have to do something different. But really what it comes down to is finding meaning, I think, in life, a deeper richness, a deeper meaning in life. Um, Whitney, and when you disrupt yourself, you unleash the greatness within. Love it. Look how you tied that in. Look at that. Okay. All right. What, how, what should people know in terms of how to get a hold of you? What, would you like to how to reach them? me? Yeah. You know what? I think since this is a podcast, probably the best way you're obviously a podcast listener um, to all of you who are listening, you can um, go to my, you can find disrupt yourself anywhere, Apple, et cetera, but go to whitneyjohnson.com and you can, and um, listen to podcasts. If you want to drill down on 
um, playing your distinctive strengths, you can listen to episode 120. If you want to drill down on embracing your constraints, you can listen to episode 140. And to make it very easy, if you want to listen to taking the right risk, you can listen to episode 100. So that's probably the easiest way for people who are, your interest is peaked. Perfect. Whitney, thank you for being on the Unleash Your Greatness Within podcast. It was great having you. Thank you for having me, TJ. You bet.